Um, has anybody heard the phrase recently? Uh, I've heard it so many times, but thank goodness for technology. Thank goodness for technology. Have anybody ever heard that phrase, especially here recently? Yeah, we're hearing it a lot, right? Because our current state of events, they are discouraging us from being face-to-face as much as possible. And so we've become really familiar with these guys, haven't we? Um, Unfortunately, I think I know what all of those are. And these are all video messaging services where you don't have to be face-to-face. You can just pull up one of these Zoom, FaceTime, Skype, um, Facebook Messenger. And is anybody tired of Zoom yet? I, I never, oh my goodness, Zoom, especially our poor kids who are in school trying to do school on Zoom. And man, it's rough. Think about this, though, the beauty of technology. My kids, I have a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old. My kids will never know of a phone that you can't see the person you're talking to. They won't know that ever existed unless we tell them. Every phone they'll ever have used had the ability to see somebody that you were talking to. Isn't that crazy? Are you feeling old yet? One of the cool things, though, if you've ever lived far from family is that these technologies are really nice, actually, because even though you're far away, you can actually feel really close to somebody. And we lived far from family for four years when we were in Chicago. We weren't close to either side of family. And I don't know what we would have done if the kids couldn't call up grandma and see her face on the screen. That just changes everything. So I'm thankful for technology. I'm thankful for these apps. I'm thankful for the productivity that we have, the efficiency you can go. When you have cell phones that alert you on just about anything and everything you need them to alert you on, and you can go faster and do more, and you can, you can do things more powerfully because of technology, and I'm grateful for that. But at the same time, new technology brings the death of old forms of communication. And one of my favorite old forms of communication is the letter, right? Anybody remember letters? (laughs) There's something about a letter, and I think the letter is the anticipation. You know, it used to take the post office three days or whatever to deliver a a letter if you were lucky. That was the the early time frame. Now they've gotten a little quicker, I think. But you you can almost sense the emotion in the handwritten note, and then the time it takes to get there, there's some buildup, and there's, there's, um, there's some meaning and power There's effort. You have to actually be intentional and take some effort to write a letter. And there's a lot of good about letters. I think about this, uh, I think it was this summer, uh, Carol Lee has three younger sisters. And uh, the the one that's uh, in the middle of those three, my boys don't know her all that well because they haven't got to spend a whole lot of time with her over the years. But during COVID, she sat down and she wrote my boys a letter. And sent them a letter just to check in, just to say hi. I thought that was the coolest thing because there's something about a letter that lets you in on that person's life and it says, man, I really care. I'm being intentional here. I can remember receiving letters in high school. Maybe you do. Junior high, after we had moved away, friends would send letters. And man, when you see that letter in the mail, your heart kind of skips a a little bit differently. You're excited about that. Different than the way my heart skips when I see an email. That's usually dread, right? It's like, uh-oh, what's, what's this about? But a letter is, there's excitement there. And if you're wondering about the power of a letter, uh, you could go into my sock drawer today. If you did, you'd find a letter there from my dad that he wrote me probably 10 years ago. And I've kept it. And I will always keep that. There's something powerful about letters. I sometimes forget that 22 of the 27 books in the New Testament were letters written by somebody to a specific recipient. Did you realize that? That the, the, the vast majority of the New Testament is a letter that somebody was writing to somebody, not to be in the Bible. It wasn't a letter to be in the Bible. It was a letter written to somebody or to a group of somebody's called a church. And so imagine what it must have been like for the church kind of like this, the gathered church to receive one of those letters coming from your leader and somebody would stand up and begin to read the news that they had for you. 
You've been waiting maybe months, maybe years from hearing from this person, and now somebody stands up to read a letter. And this is the kind of anticipation in which we should feel, and this is the kind of anticipation that they did feel in the book of Revelation when reading or being uh, listening to, I should say, when somebody read to them the book of Revelation. They had this type of anticipation. So today we're going to turn, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 2 is where we're going to be. And did you know that Revelation is a letter? It was written specifically for the local church In fact, it was actually written for seven local churches. That was the purpose of the book of Revelation. And we need to pause briefly here and remind ourselves something about the book of Revelation. Okay, this is really important. If we're going to move forward here, we need to have a quick word about Revelation. Because when a lot of you hear Revelation, your mind automatically goes or begins to envision an impossible to understand book of all kinds of wild predictions, coded predictions that nobody could understand unless you have a Bible degree about the end of the world. Now, unfortunately, people in the church have figured out that if you, want, if you make Revelation into that sort of thing, you can make a lot of money. You can sell a lot of books. You can write movies. You can do all kinds of fun things if Revelation becomes this sort of coded, predictive text. But remember now that Revelation isn't that. Revelation is a letter It's a letter from a disciple of Jesus who was sent away in solitary confinement. They sent him to an island all by himself. His name is John, and he's on this island of Patmos. And now he's thinking about very real people in very real churches that he knew, that he was familiar with, and now he's writing them a letter. And what is this letter that he's writing them? Here's what happens. is John's on this island, and he has a vision, and the vision is of the realm of God, Jesus' victory. And so John is kind of invited to pull back the curtain and see the, the realm in which God lives. And it's final. Everything is done. And Jesus is on the throne and he's reigning victorious and he sees him in all of his glory. And now John writes this letter to the seven churches to tell them, with this vision in mind, I want you to have a new perspective. I want you to see your circumstances differently. I want you to see the world differently. If you could see what I just saw, the end of the story in God's realm, you might think of your life a little bit differently. So he's writing to give them a new lens. And Revelation is not meant to be predictive, but rather imaginative. There are so many scenes that are full of imagery, and this is the apocalyptic, prophetic way of writing in that time. And so when John writes this letter to this church, he's counting on them understanding what some of these visions and some of these images mean. So it's not predictive as much as it is imaginative. And here's what I mean by that, and this is, I think, where it gets most clear. Revelation, the purpose of Revelation was not for Brady Thelander, to identify the Antichrist in the year 2021. I don't believe that's why Revelation was written. But rather, that we would all, everyone who reads Revelation, be able to identify the many Antichrists who are invading this realm and the evil all around us in whatever period of history we live. Evil all looks the same. It has the same DNA. It has the same purpose to destroy the good intentions of God. Same attributes. And Revelation helps us to identify and deal with those evils in light of, get this, Christ's final triumph. So it is not to be scary. We hear the good news first, and then we look at the evil in front of us. And John chooses to do all of this in the form of a letter, which is pretty cool, isn't it? I love that. So, in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, Jan and Jessica are going to come down front here now. These letters were custom written, this is key, with intimate knowledge of their local context and their specific surroundings and circumstances. Okay, so John sees these seven churches, and he knows something about each of them individually. And when he writes these seven letters to the seven churches, he speaks to their specific circumstances 
And as we dive in, we're going to listen to two of these seven letters, okay? So these are two of the seven letters. The first one will be read by Jan, and this is the letter to the church in Ephesus. Go ahead, would you, Jan? To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But if you have this in your favor, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, thank you. So as Jessica reads the second letter, just imagine you're in one of these, these first century churches listening to this for the first time as John writes this to you. So this is the letter to Pergamum. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was to put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give the person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Awesome. Thank you. So as I read and studied these verses earlier this year, I began to daydream about what might be said in a letter written to Sepulpa Church of the Nazarene. You have these seven local churches. What if God could look down on our local congregation and see us in our current circumstance? And what if he could write us a letter? What might be said to our church? Sure, we can benefit from hearing what was said to these churches, and we do and we should. And in no way am I proposing here that we are trying to rewrite Scripture and we should petition this to be added to Revelation. That's not the point here, okay? What this is is a creative exercise. And what if we imagined God writing us a letter in our current circumstances in view of Jesus' final victory? What would he say to us? So each year, your church board, who is elected by this, this, uh, this congregation every year, Every fall, we go and we have a church board retreat. And really, if you ask any of them, they'll tell you it's not really a retreat because we get right to work. <laughs> and it's an intensive. We have about 20 hours together, I think. And we just really focus in on what God might be saying to us as a congregation. What are some things we can do to take next steps towards our mission? How do we clarify where God's at work and come around each other and affirm that in each other? And so we try to get on the same page with a clear vision and purpose for the coming year. And so we did that this last fall. And today, we want to share our creative writing with you. Is that okay? Again, we aren't claiming divine inspiration. We don't believe this is on the same line of Scripture. This isn't absolute truth. But we are vulnerably sharing what we think God might be saying to us in this season of our church. We are trying to interpret and discern those things. So our hope is that this letter will serve to shape us into the image of God as a church in 2021. So here's the fascinating thing about the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. Each of these letters that were written, they have these common attributes. They all have similar structure. 
And of course they do. They were written by the same man. Uh, they're right after each other. But there's this really unique structure, and, and they have the same characteristics. And here's what they are. There's four things that you can notice in these letters. And one is that Jesus is introduced uniquely. So Jesus is introduced as uh, the, the person, the characteristic that that church needs to know Jesus as. So every church is introduced to Jesus with a different attribute. If you have your Bibles open, you can begin to look at that, and I'll show you that in a moment. But number two, the, the good of the church, you probably heard as the ladies read these stories, the good of the church is celebrated, and they're told what they're doing well. But number three, the not good of the church is reprimanded as well. And usually the letter says something like, but I have this against you. And the not so good is visited. And number four, the church receives a promise. Every church receives a promise. If they are to be obedient in what God's calling them to do, then they have a unique promise for that specific congregation. So at our board retreat, we divided the sessions up into four components. And I want to walk you through this and then read you our letter. And we asked the Lord to reveal himself in much the same way that these churches heard about Jesus. So... First, in Revelation, Jesus was introduced to the seven churches like this. This is some of the ways he was introduced. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. The one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. The first and the last. The one who was dead and came to life. The one with the sharp two-edged sword. The one with flaming eyes. So you begin to see Jesus introduced in these different ways. And each of these descriptions meant something very powerful to that local congregation. It was tailor-made for what they needed to hear. So we discussed how Jesus might introduce himself to us, Sepulpa Church of the Nazarene, in our current reality. And we landed on the story from Ezekiel 37, in which the prophet Ezekiel is taken to a valley full of dead bones, full of dry bones. And God begins to work this incredible miracle, bringing life to the bones, and tendons are forming, and breath is filling up their lungs. And we imagine Jesus stepping into the room at that board retreat and saying to us that he was the bone-rattling God. The God who takes tired and weary and dead things and brings them to glorious life. This is the Jesus who is speaking to us. This is the God we pray to. This is why we gather here this morning. This is the one who's directing our church even this day, sustaining us and bringing beauty amongst us. We listen to a song by Elevation Worship, which says this, Our God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. Just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of Elisha if there's anything that he can't do. Just ask the stone that was rolled at the tomb in the garden what happens when God says to move. I feel him moving it now. I feel him doing it now. All of a sudden, we were a whole lot less concerned with what was limiting our congregation, our church, and more concerned with our limitless God. He's the bone-rattling God. So we defined the attribute of Jesus specific to our setting, and then we look back at the good that was happening in our midst. And in Revelation, the churches were celebrated for, for these things, for their hard work, their perseverance. Staying true in the midst of persecution. This was a common theme because the church was under um, incredible persecution at the time. They were commended for their love and their faith and their service. More went on from there. So we began to ask at the retreat, so what was admirable about our local assembly? We celebrated the addition of new staff this year. We're so grateful for Pastor Evan and continue to be thankful for Debbie and her work with our children, which means stronger communication, which means updated facilities, which means discipleship efforts that you're going to be hearing about in the next few weeks that are really exciting. We celebrate the progress and impact we are making in our youth ministry, the culture change there, the impact on families, inviting families in, visiting families, the increase of quality in our children's programming, the growth in our children's involvement. 
We stepped up our local outreach in midst of COVID and during the pandemic with pizza and prayer and workforce Oklahoma gifts, teacher appreciation notes, food giveaways to local elementary school families. We adapted our online presence during the suspension of services and found creative ways to stay connected and leadership was strong. We celebrated the ways in which we, we uh, worked towards the promises we made last year. If you remember last year, we made four promises at the church and these are the promises. And we celebrated our, our throne room prayer services that we had four times this last year. We even had guests join us for, for some of those services and the, the intimate time we had together there. We promised to greet each person at the door and you probably noticed our improved first impressions movement people being involved and in, in making efforts there. We promised to know and pray for five of our neighbors. And this summer, we went through a series called Won't You Be My Neighbor? And we, we resourced you to know and pray for your five neighbors. And I have a handful of stories from my neighborhood that came out of that effort. And then we promised to launch a program to help mentor our youth. And we've done that this fall with the help of a few of you ladies that have stepped in and we've began a mentoring program. Some of our youth have been a part of that just to help them in this really weird year to work on schoolwork and to have some support. Thankful for the progress we made. There's a lot to celebrate, isn't there? Isn't that good news? I was thankful for the good of this church, but it's easier to celebrate the wins than to acknowledge the shortcomings and that's a little bit harder. And these are some of the shortcomings that the seven churches in Revelation were reprimanded for, for forsaking your first love. That's a big one. Clinging to false teaching, for tolerating idols, or one of the more famous reprimands that you might be aware of in Revelation is being lukewarm. You remember the scripture where, where it says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. You're good for nothing. You're lukewarm. You're dead on the inside. So as a team, we began to ask questions about what was standing between us and the fulfillment of our mission. What was keeping us from seeing what we hope to see, which is one more life transformed by grace? What were our weaknesses and our threats? So we identified that we aren't great at inviting and welcoming guests. That's part of the first impressions effort that we made. But we want to be more than friendly, right? Right? We must improve the way we engage with and follow up with our visitors. From signage and wayfinding to gathering info and follow up to encouraging and equipping people to take their next step in discipleship, we have to do better. If our people are going to feel comfortable inviting their friends, we must become a place in which people have every confidence that their friend is going to be welcomed and received well, right? We also need more people involved in the mission and the ministry of the church. We need greater involvement and investment. We must find ways to lead people from consumer to contributor. The church was not meant to be consumed. The sermon is not the most important part of your weekly church experience. How can all of us be a part of something bigger than ourselves and be involved as contributors? If we are going to become a multi-generational church again, we must be clearer in our priorities and good stewards of the energies that we do have. The baton must be passed from one generation to the next as we step into our preferred future. And finally, we must be better at discipling our people. Finding creative ways to approach our corporate spiritual growth and our corporate prayer time together. These were the challenges laid out in front of us. And this was the promise given, we felt, if we would be obedient. And in Revelation, these are the promises given to the seven churches. And these are unique to their circumstances, to the right to eat from the tree of life, to not be hurt by second death, a stone with their new names written down on it, or to be made a pillar in the temple, which is kind of a cool one. So what was the motivational promise for our church and we went back to Ezekiel, same passage of the dry bones coming to life. and says, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. This is the promise that we are claiming. To be alive, 
to be filled with his spirit. So with this thought, with these thoughts, I should say in mind, we wanted to share our letter with you. We actually crafted a letter. The staff came together after the retreat, worked on a letter. If you're visiting today, I know this might seem a little intimate, yet I ask for your grace as we are just vulnerable together. And my prayer, if you are visiting, is you might see this as a church that's imperfect, of course, and has a ways to go, but a church that you feel called to be a part of, a church that you could make home, that you could belong to. This was our letter. Imagine this next to the letters in Revelation. To the church in Sepulpa, right? The God who rattles dry bones in the valley and breathes new life into the weary. Hear the word of the Lord. I see the hard work you are investing in your foundation. You are building a team. You're transforming student and children's ministries, and you're seeking opportunities to practically love your community. You are committed to praying together. Yet many are disconnected from a place of ministry and a place of belonging. Your preferences still obstruct your guests. Your neighbors are strangers. If you're listening, take the plunge. Commit to worship. Commit to ministry and commit to a group. To those who see church as an opportunity to bless other people, I will make you come alive. That's our letter. And as I think about this letter, I want to say something. I am so proud to be your pastor. I hope you know that. Not only am I proud of who you are and the ways in which you are thriving, but I'm proud to be a part of a church who their church board will get away on a weekend and begin to evaluate the ways in which we could be more effective in our mission. To look at our shortcomings and to strive to be more Christ-like and obedient. Revelation promises us that Christ has already won the fight. That's the whole point. Jesus is on the throne. The victory is ours Nothing can stand against. We are victorious. And in that victory, we are called into obedience. So, I hope we will learn this coming year to flourish. And we're going to talk about that in the next few weeks. But as we wrap up today, I I want you to consider how you might invest or reinvest in the mission and the ministry of Sepulpa Church of the Nazarene. Now I know COVID, right? The ultimate excuse that we can use for everything. I know you're busy. If you're not busy, praise the Lord. You are the the 1% of us who are not busy. I know you're tired. Some of you are really tired. And not just like the superficial tired, but you're tired because you've laid yourself out for the Lord and His church for years. I see your weariness. I know you've done it before and it might have been really not your favorite thing. I know you've done it before and you didn't get out of it what you thought you might. I know you've done it before, told yourself you wouldn't do it again. I know. I've been there. But these next few weeks together, we're going to look at what it looks like for us to come alive in, in, in the vein of this letter, what it looks like for us to flourish. And I hope you'll commit to be a part of each of these services for the next few weeks as we discuss our main priorities, as we step into this new year and allow God to prompt you to lean in a bit more. Lean into the mission of the church. But I'll close with this. Church is a collection. That's what church is. It's a collection. It means that if we're going to be transformed as a church, it's going to be because we're a collection of people who are being transformed by the Lord. That's how that happens. 
We're not going to become the church that we want to become because we have a good plan or because the board gets away and comes up with a cool letter or because we know our weaknesses or because we understand our strengths. We're going to become the church that we need to become when we as individuals lean into the transformation available to us in Jesus. We are a collection of people. We are as good as the individuals who come together and make our church our church. So do you believe in your heart that Jesus is victorious? That's the first question. And that's the issue set down by John the Revelator in Revelation. Do you believe the victory will be ours? And not only victory in the large scale, but do you believe in your heart that God is able to do more than you can think or imagine in your circumstances, in your life? Do you believe in transformation on a personal level that God's grace can make you new? As you consider and pray about your investment in the church, I challenge you to begin praying about your own personal surrender and commitment to Jesus. Because no letter or mission statement or organization has the power to transform your life like the power of Jesus to transform your life. So what the church needs most is people to lean in and reevaluate how they can give themselves more fully to the Lord. And I believe as we do, He can use us. We can flourish. But the bone-rattling God will breathe new life into us. Do you believe that? Heavenly Father, I thank you for Sepulpa Church of the Nazarene. A collection of people that's been on this corner for a hundred years this June. A hundred years of life transformation. A hundred years of perseverance. A hundred years of worship and prayer, discipleship. God, what a gift. I think about the people sitting in these chairs today and how their life is different because this church flourished on this corner. Lord, we thank you that you know exactly what to do with weary and dry and stale and dead and ugly and dirty and all the messes of our lives that we have all of the junk that we carry around, all that inhibits us as people, you've redeemed and you've called back to new life. So we pray for that in our own lives, Lord, in this moment, that there would be transformation of our hearts and souls, that we would return to our first love, that you would restore and renew us. And as you do, I know and believe and trust that this collection of believers will begin to flourish. That you will bring us to a new beauty that maybe we haven't seen in this unique way. That you would take us someplace together that we can't get to on our own. And so, Lord, help us. Help us in our surrender. Help us in our commitment. Help us and our desire to be close to you. We look forward to 2021 as you step in and lead us to new places, beautiful places, places of bringing your kingdom to this earth. We pray in your name. Amen.